Welcome to Lesson 4 of Inventive Problem Solving in Biomedical Engineering. Now that we thoroughly understand contradictions that underlie all inventive problems, we're now going to begin to study tools for resolving contradictions. In particular, we're going to look at Alt Schuller's System of Inventive Operators, also known as Inventive Principles. So as a reminder, we stated that inventive solutions to problems involve resolution of contradictions. We put it in all caps because it is such an important tenet of trees. We didn't at the time tell you how to solve those contradictions. That's what today's lecture is about. So recall, there are two types of contradictions. The technical contradictions is a situation in which one characteristic of a, of a system improves, another must degrade. Physical contradiction is a situation in which a characteristic of a system must exist in two states or something must be both absent and present. But first I'd like to share this philosophical discussion of trees that was put forth by Kaplan. It may or may not help you understand the principle but it was well received by the trees community and it can't hurt. He uses an example of a quadratic equation lower left hand corner. You could technically solve that equation by guessing the value of x, plugging it into your calculator, and then trying it over and over until the result is nearly zero. Or you can recognize that that's a, sp a specific version of this general problem, ax squared plus bx plus c, for which we have an already solved solution, albeit abstract. If you can make that leap, then you can apply the specificity of this particular problem into the abstract solution and get your specific answer to the specific problem. This is what engineers do all the time. We call it modeling. It's whenever we apply an equation to a design situation. So by analogy, if you have an inventive problem, it can also be solved through trial and error or it could be recognized as an, a, uh, a specific version of a general problem. We can abstract it to a higher level for which a set of solutions may already exist which can then be applied, specialized, and then solve your specific problem. I presented the same principle in the first lesson using the slide adapted from Ideation International in which a specific problem, my problem, is decomposed into its fundamental parts for which exist corresponding solutions which are known as inventive principles which can then be reconstructed to create a solution for my specific problem. When Al Schuller analyzed the world's patents, he identified 40 general principles of invention, which he defined in terms of 40 inventive operators. These are solutions to technical contradictions. They're listed here in shorthand form. They all have nicknames like segmentation, extraction, and version. It's somewhat imposing at first, but we'll learn them one at a time until they're second nature. Here's one example just to give you an idea of what I mean. This is inventive operator number 22, convert harm into a benefit. It has three subtypes. The first is utilizing harmful factors or harmful effect of an environment to obtain a positive effect. Secondly, remove a harmful factor by adding it with another harmful factor. And C, increase the amount of harmful action until it ceases to be harmful. Rather interesting, rather abstract, so let me give you an example. Electric artery, if you haven't heard of it before, it's a way in which most surgeons perform surgery today. It's the way that they perform incisions. And they use electricity, and electricity in a certain way, typically at high frequency, but of such intensity that instead of electrocuting the patient, it creates heat, which severs the tissue 
and cauterizes or burns it, denatures it in the process. So this is an, an obvious example of 22C, increasing the amount of harmful action until it actually becomes a useful action. And so on. In the references in Blackboard, you'll see all 40 with some examples, which we will further um, append over the course of the semester. So in numerical order, there are 40 of them, and it's a long list from 1 to 40. And as I said, you'll get familiar with them. You'll probably develop some favorites along the way. And the more that we work with them, the more apparent it will be what they mean and how they're used, and you'll be able to identify them whenever you see an inventive solution. So you may be wondering, how do you determine which of those 40 inventive operators to choose for a given problem? Well, first, you have to define the problem in terms of a contradiction, as we learned earlier, and specifically to define it in terms of these engineering parameters that Altshuler simultaneously identified as he was analyzing the world's patents. There are 39 of them, and they're relatively simple. Sometimes you have to really stretch your imagination to fit them to your problem, but once again, they should become familiar over the course of the semester as you solve more and more problems and as we show you more examples. So once you've identified the two competing parameters, you then go to this contradiction matrix, once again defined by Altshuler, in which the rows represent the features that you want to improve, columns represent the undesired results or the features that are degraded. Then the corresponding cell, that's the intersection of the two, has the shorthand notion of the various inventive operators that apply to that given problem. So here's an example that I'm going to illustrate by way of cerebral palsy. If you don't know, it's a group of neuromuscular disorders caused by damage to the brain, often during childbirth, that leaves a child unable to control his or her muscles. The etymology, in case you're interested, is cerebral for brain, palsy for muscle weakness, it affects the muscle tone, control, balance, coordination, posture, reflex, overall body movement. It makes simple tasks like raising your hands or feeding yourself or dressing yourself a major challenge. So in this particular problem, we have weight of a moving object. It could be something as simple as a fork or your hands for that matter, which is at odds with the amount of force that your muscles are able to generate. Let's return now to the contradiction matrix for this particular problem in which the intersection of weight of moving object and force yields these four inventive operators. Counterweight, prior action, mechanical vibration, thermal expansion. Let's choose this one, prior action, also known as preliminary action, having two subtypes. A, carry out the required action in advance, in full or at least in part. B arrange objects so they can go into action without time loss waiting for the action and from the most convenient position. So if you were to read this, I wonder if it would stimulate some kind of creative solution that would help this young child lift their arms with their own strength using preliminary action. What would you do? Well, here's an idea using prior action is to create an exoskeleton in which rubber bands are used to store force and to really bias or positively assist the patient in lifting the object. So heavy objects would appear light. It's very similar to, let's say, power steering in your car. And once you see the solution, you have to say, this is a rather clever idea, and I wish I had thought of it myself. Well, you could have if you had just gone through the steps using the inventive principles. While we're on the topic of prior action, let's look at another quick example. You may or may not have had the unfortunate experience of a broken limb, but you probably know someone who has had a cast on their arm. What you may not know is how they get the cast off the arm. They need to use a very sharp saw, and to the naked eye, you can see a disaster waiting to happen. 
Let's try to formulate this in terms of the contradiction. Looking at it one way, we realize the cast has to be stiff in order to support the broken limb. But on the other hand, the stiffness and the strength of that cast makes it impossible or difficult to remove. Looking at it another way, from the point of view of the, the removal, we need a sharp tool to cut through this, this tough, strong cast. But that same sharp tool might also cut the patient's skin. From a physical contradiction perspective, the tool must be sharp to cut the cast, and the tool must be dull to avoid cutting the skin. So here's an inventive solution using prior action. You have a cast, and prior to the cast actually hardening, you embed secretly a hacksaw blade, flexible and embedded in a protective sleeve so it obviously doesn't hurt the patient. Then when it comes time to remove the cast, you merely attach a handle to that hacksaw blade and then you cut from the inside out. So that solution was actually not proposed by me, it was proposed by Altruller himself. And it reminds me, if you may realize an analogy, to one of these tear strips that you might see inside a, a pack of gum or a, a Band-Aid. It's a similar kind of feature where the tool to remove the wrapper or remove um, the outer covering is already built into the wrapping itself as a prior action. So another one of the inventive principles was counterweight, in which the definition is compensating for an object's weight by joining it with another object that has a lifting force, or B, compensate for the weight of an object by interaction with an environment providing aerodynamic or hydrodynamic forces. Well, if you ever wondered in the movies how actors are able to lift heavy objects like the back of a car, well, it's because there's a counterweight that makes it actually very light to lift. I don't have a particular invention in mind or uh, an example for the cerebral palsy example, but you might be able to envision that instead of rubber bands, maybe there is a counterweight on the, let's say the back of that exoskeleton, or maybe there is some kind of pulley like overhead that provides uh, a lifting force. So the contradiction matrix, as you can imagine, is rather extensive because it is a 40 by 40 matrix. And that is provided for you in two forms. It's in a PDF um, in the uh, back of Kaplan's book. And I also provided an Excel version that is somewhat semi-automated in which you insert the parameter to improve the undesired result, and it gives you the uh, the corresponding inventive principles, just to make it a little bit easier. Both of them are available in the reference section on Blackboard. Here's another simple example, an oxygen supply. For someone at home with, let's say, heart or lung failure that needs a constant supply of oxygen, the problem statement is that we need a large supply of oxygen so we don't run out, but a large bottle is very heavy and uh, hard to pour it around, but yet a small bottle may provide inadequate amount of oxygen. So this is a technical contradiction in which the useful parameter is the amount of a substance, number 26, and the harmful parameter is the weight of a stationary object, number two. Going to the contradiction matrix, we see the intersection yields these four principles. 27, use an inexpensive short-lived object instead of an expensive durable one. Specifically, replace an expensive object by a collection of inexpensive ones compromising other properties, longevity, for instance. So that's kind of like using smaller bottles or multiple smaller bottles, I should say. 26, copying. Use a simple and inexpensive copy instead of an object which is complex, expensive, fragile, or inconvenient to operate. Replace an object or a system of objects by their optical, copy. optical image. Scale can be used to produce or enlarge the image and see if visible optical copies are used, replace them with infrared or ultraviolet copies. So obviously 26B and C are completely irrelevant to this problem. Optics has nothing to do with the problem. 
But using an inexpensive copy is an idea. So rather than using an industrial strength stainless steel bottle, perhaps we could use a fiber reinforced plastic bottle. Maybe not as durable, maybe not uh, appropriate for a uh, hospital setting or an ambulance setting, but maybe just what you need at home. 18 is mechanical vibration, which I'm going to skip because I can't quite see uh, the uh, relevance. And number 35 is transform the physical or chemical states of an object. So changing the aggregate state of an object, concentration of density, degree of flexibility, temperature. So that's a very intriguing solution. And it's going to be something of a stretch of the imagination. It's going to take some work to capitalize on that idea. But it's definitely pointing us in the right direction. So here is a very popular inventive solution to the problem. It's known as the Helios Portable Oxygen System. It's basically a tank of liquid oxygen for ambulatory use. It's very small. It's lightweight because it doesn't need a gigantic tank. And it actually provides about eight or 10 hours of oxygen at a nominal flow setting. An even more inventive solution is what's called an oxygen concentrator. This is a device that sucks oxygen out of the atmosphere where it's readily available and provides pure form of oxygen or concentrated form of oxygen um, to the patient. So air goes in one end, concentrated oxygen comes out the other end. And it's a clear use of resources in avoiding the need for any kind of supply or tank containing oxygen. Here's another example. Let us reinvent an award-winning medical product. The problem statement is as follows. A nurse physician phlebotomist needs to locate a vein for venipuncture, but the vein is hidden beneath the skin. The resources here are the blood vessel, the blood, the skin, muscle, amongst other things. The blood itself is comprised of red blood cells and plasma. The red blood cells contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin contains a color, viscosity, amongst other things. And there are more resources available, gravity and air, etc. But these are the relevant ones that I want to focus on. So the statement is we want to access the vein without trial and error technical contradiction is we want to see the blood vessel without having to cut open the skin. So we need to again stretch our imagination somewhat to fit this into the 39 parameters. I chose measurement accuracy as the useful parameter because we want to be able to identify that vein accurately. And the harmful parameter is the brightness in that we can't see the, the uh, vein against uh, the background of the skin. So referring now to our contradiction matrix, the three inventive principles provided is 1, 6, and 32, segmentation, universality, and 32. I'm going to go straight to 32, which is changing the color, which at first seems to be kind of irrelevant. But here they are, the four subtypes. Change the color of an object or its surrounding. Change the degree of translucency of an object or surrounding. Use colored additives to observe objects or processes which are difficult to see. If such additives are already used, employ luminescent traces or tracer elements. So it's kind of interesting. So maybe we could inject uh, a fluorescent dye into the vein and maybe ultraviolet light to um, cause the vein to glow. Just in some examples, uh, principle 32 is a transparent bandage enables a wound to be inspected without the dressing being removed. Another kind of industrial example is in steel mills. A water curtain is designed to protect workers from overheating. But this curtain only protects from infrared rays, so the bright light from the melted steel can easily get through the curtain. So a coloring was added to the water to create a filter effect while remaining transparent. Why do I bring up these examples? Because in the tree software that you're going to learn in a, a couple of weeks, it's replete with all of these industrial examples. They're the basis of Altschuler's theory. So we often have to try and really uh, draw distant analogies from the industrial examples to our medical solution. We're working gradually to replace those 
uh, and supplement them with, uh, with medical examples. But moving right along, here's the invention. It's called the Vein Illumination System AccuVein AV400. And it's a real device. It really exists. It's a 2013 Gold Award winner from the Medical Design Excellence Awards. And it's really nothing but a, a filtered light that selectively illuminates the skin at the, ex, uh, at the expense or um, at the exclusion uh, of the color of the, uh, of the blood. So this is a, a product that's actually catching on, and you'll probably see them um, someday in the near future in uh, the clinic if you have your uh, blood drawn. Now, it would be counterproductive for me to go through all 40 of these principles here in this lecture. I'm going to instead allow you to discover them on your own by way of the homework assignments and the in-class exercises over the next couple of weeks. I have provided for you, however, a reference document that's compiled from a number of different sources and it's available on Blackboard. Here's the table of contents. And here's just a typical example. Inventive principle number one, segmentation. You'll see that the definition and the subtypes are indicated, A, B, and C. And for each one of those are some examples uh, provided just in words. And then a more detailed example that's broken down into the problem statement, the articulation of a contradiction in the proper syntax, then uh, identification of the uh, altruler parameter to improve and the one that is uh, to be avoided, and then uh, the implementation of that principle to an inventive solution. In blue, I have indicated medical examples that we have um, recently added to the list of examples, along with the industrial examples that are provided by um, the uh, ideation software, uh, such as the electroplating in this particular example. So that document is about uh, 30 or so pages long, and it's, um, it's somewhat of a condensed version of the one that I keep for myself because uh, it's a work in progress and uh, some of them are still a little bit sloppy and not in the right format. But part of your homework is actually to work to supplement this list. Oh, by the way, um, the bad news is that there are actually 300 principles, not just 40. But the good news is that you don't need to memorize all 300 principles. They're embedded into the Innovation Workbench software that the ideation people are making available to you for free, at least for the duration of the semester. So at your earliest convenience, please download that software and uh, begin to install it on your computer. All right, now it's your turn. There's really no better way to learn the inventive principles than up close and personal on your own. And that's the intention of these two exercises this week. The first asks you to watch this video of 25 accidental inventions that changed the world. And out of those, to choose 10, and within those 10, to identify the inventive operator that is fundamental to that invention, and to do a little bit more dissecting in terms of contradictions and resources, etc. It should take you about 30 minutes. It's worth about 10 points. The next exercise is a little bit more intense. I'm going to guess it's going to take you 50 to 60 minutes. There's also 10 examples, but you're going to have to do some more digging to actually hunt for um, representative examples uh, for each of those principles. We're going to start with these 10, and as I said, we're going to build on them throughout the semester until we're familiar with all 40. And I assure you that uh, the effort you put in will pay off on Thursday when we have a very action-packed, exciting workshop in store for you. Looking forward to seeing you then.